idea is, can you think about repeatedly, meth through methodology, come up with breakthrough innovations? Or does it have to be, as society believes today, highly um, kind of unexpected, serendipitous, uh, these you know, magic moments of miracles happening and then wealth being created from it? That, that romantic notion is something that I'm going to try to dispel as much as I can. Now, those of you who are on that romantic journey, I don't want to discourage you. Turns out you can also do it that way. So keep doing it that way. But what's been interesting to me is to say, does it really have to be done that way, or is there another way? Uh, and, and I call this kind of, as, as a loose terminology, reverse discovery. And, and I'll explain what I mean by that. But before getting there, uh, let me first say how, how exciting it is to be here um, with my close friend and partner, Ruben Vartanian. We've been engaged in development projects in Armenia now for coming on to 19 years. And in those 19 years, save one or two talks I've given on, on entrepreneurship, um, I've never given a talk to an audience that had any scientists in it that I was aware of, and, and never talked about what I do in Boston. So I always am envious of my doctor friends that come here and teach cardiac surgery and all sorts of exciting things, and, and I've never really had an audience who actually cared about innovation and and, 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 and commercialization. So it's, it's exciting to have this venue, and I commend the FAST team for organizing what, what has been a great, uh, great uh, conference. So I want to just start out by getting you in the mindset and, and just also to reveal my bias right up front. And I want you to think about what you think is the biggest innovation from the point of view of value, creating value for society. I'm not talking about just value economically, but just value. Um, and in, our, in that 50 years, personal computers were invented, mobile telephony, communications was totally transformed, the internet came about, search engines, these look old, this is an older slide by the way, electric cars, satellites, all of biotechnology didn't exist more than 40 years ago, sequencing of genomes, we had no idea what, how we were comprised, that is what our basic DNA was, and on and on and on. And so if you think about this, I'm not going to ask you to vote. But as you think about this and maybe other ones that you're your favorite that may not be here, I'd like to propose that the single biggest innovation that has created value for society is actually none of these, but it is the startup venture. So you might find that weird because you probably expected a technology to be an innovation. But the definition of an innovation is a thing or a process that is new and that represents an advance. In this case, the notion that Regular human beings, not descendants from royalty or very rich American families, could actually have ideas that they could find money for, the legal construct to create companies in, and the surrounding support system to take something that is initially highly speculative and then create the companies we've all, we've all come to understand and cherish and view as iconic successes. In your mind, if you were thinking Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, by my definition of the underlying innovation, but for the methodology of a startup venture, none of this would exist. Now, you could argue that General Electric might have invented mobile phones and, and maybe uh, digital might have invented personal computers, but they didn't. Uh, because every one of these older generation companies, digital itself was one of the original startups, the, st the notion that what has happened in the 31 years I've been practicing this field is nothing more than an economic revolution. In fact, this all goes back 60, 70 years ago. In fact, a, a, an economist, Joseph Schumpeter, who was studying uh, writings of Marx and others about socialism, co coined this notion of creative destruction. The idea that that creative destruction is what allows economies to, make, to, to progress and that that's a natural thing as opposed to fighting the forces of creative destruction. Well, innovation is just creative destruction and startups are the most effective organism to cause that creative destruction. You might say societally, well, that sounds like a bad thing. Well, all of these things and thousands more wouldn't exist but for that. So I've revealed my bias I think that this is not a whim, this is not a kind of a generational curiosity. The startup venture process is something that I think is here to stay and contribute greatly. 
And for those of you who are in that field, you also know that this is a highly kind of clumsy speculative field. This cartoon, which I always kind of remind myself every time any one of my team or others come up with something that they say is truly, totally, totally transformative, the caption reads, this, this little tip of the pyramid, could be the discovery of the century, depending, of course, on how far down it goes. And, and that's how archaeologists feel, that's how artists feel who want to write, you know, Beethoven, probably before he wrote his famous concertos, actually thought this is a really famous concerto. But so did a thousand other composers, and theirs wasn't. And so thinking about this, one thing you'll get a sense of is there's a huge amount of humility and, 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 and self-discipline that goes with being in this field. Otherwise, you feel like you have all the power to change the world. Well, generally, that's true, but with a very low probability. So we'll come back to that in a minute. So just to, take, just to make this a little more personal, I'll take you back. So in 1987, when, when I got a PhD in MIT in what was then a new field, biological engineering, biochemical engineering, the choices I had, which is different than the choice many of you in the audience as graduates today have, was the most likely thing to do would have been to go into academia. This was a new field, people needed professors. The next likely thing was to join a large company, either in the pharmaceutical industry, chemical industry. And then there were a few mid-sized, mid to small companies. And, and I ended up 35 years ago, which was not at all the common practice, uh, and I kind of attribute this to ignorance being bliss, starting up a company. Now, the good news is, I don't have to take you through the boring history. Back then, there was in Boston area, maybe a company started every month, uh, maybe every two, three months. I, I see uh, uh, Dikram Bezjan in the audience. He was in Boston at the time doing startups, and he will know. There was, Lotus was the, was the famous new startup of the past 10 years uh, at that time, and there were one or two biotechnology companies. And so I'm not going to tell you the whole kind of story because I'm, I'm interested more in telling you what I see in the future, but my kind of entrepreneurial leap of faith, and I'm going to use these words kind of carefully. I want to also give you a sense of the narrative that keeps me thinking that what I'm involved with and what you're involved with is a sane thing to do. I'll tell you right up front, there's nothing rational about starting companies. Probability adjusted, it is probably going to be value destroying. And the notion that we do it is a tribute to our willingness to be optimistic and to take leaps of faith. And over time, we figure out what's a useful leap of faith and what's a more dangerous leap of faith. Just like when you jump, try to get across a piece of water, you learn in your life how far you have to be able to jump and how well to get to the other side. Sometimes you end up in the water. That's what a, but they all start as leaps of faith. For me, the leap of faith was, was, was a company that was called Perceptive Biosystems, and this was the first company that truly tried to develop tools for the biotechnology industry. Those of you who have done mass spectrometry with biologics, the first company that invented and launched mass spectrometers in the biotech field was this company, Perceptive Biosystems, time of flight mass spectrometers. And so, but, but also I want to tell you that science aside, the reality is that once you end up in the space of creating economic value, you are in a context. And, and you may have noticed that October 20th was the date I put up here. Turns out, unbeknownst to me, October 19th was Black Monday which since it probably is before most of you were conscious of, of markets, uh, just to tell you, this was the biggest single day drop of the markets in the US since the Great Depression. Uh, and, 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 and the effect of that, in terms of changing the availability of capital, the mood of people, etc., was not something I knew anything about, but it taught me on day one that you're not act acting in a vacuum. So that was interesting, because one, thing, one theme you'll see throughout my talk is, just how survivalist this activity is. You, know, you, could, you could make the best plans in the world, you can hire the best team in the world, and you've got to realize that the next day, you're going to be in survival mode. So all the strategies in the world doesn't keep you away from that. So that's just something to keep in mind. So the, for the first decade, I was involved in starting some companies that some of them merged with other ones, some of them were spun out, and then there were some independent ones. And, and the reason I'm telling, showing you this is not the detail, let me just skip ahead that it, throughout the 90s, I ended up experimenting with a, a number of different the companies, mostly in the life science area. One of them, kind of oddly enough, was in the solid state lighting business. It was the first LED lighting company uh, uh, started in the world, this color kinetics and all the initial IP on lights that were made out of uh, uh, LEDs back in 1998. 
And the reason I'm showing you that is to say why I ended up going down the path of what I am going to talk about today, which is the company that I now run called Flagship Pioneering. So, you, you kind of, if you t saw me talk 10 years ago, I would have talked about the rest of this. I'm not going to. But just simply to say, after spending a decade involved in starting companies with different teams in different ways, the thing that, is, that got me interested is this question. Can you institutionalize entrepreneurial innovation? And so let me tell you what I think about that in the coming slides. <clears throat> As I do that, I just want to give you a few th themes to think about because in, this, you know, in the 20 years preceding, uh, here were some of the, the, the thoughts that I extracted that contributed to what I'm going to describe to you and what, what it is that we practice. The first insight I would take away is that innovation is emergent. What does that mean? Uh, people describe breakthrough innovations as though it's something they did. In my opinion, what they're describing is the last bit that they did that was based on everything else that came before them, and yet it looks like the innovation was just what they did. But that's not at all true. That would be as though humans described their last step in evolution as what everything else was leading up to and all the rest was not evolution at all. Well, there are lots of humans who do describe it that way, but you all know that's not true as scientists, that everything is evolving and everything that came before was just as a successful innovation as a human is. So think about innovation as an emergent field. And the reason I say that is that in the field of emergent processes, one of the things that we know a lot about is Darwinian evolution. The simple notion that if you do systematically variation, selection, and iteration, you get novelty. Now you get novelty that is selected for its competitive advantage in the particular time and point at which that competition was happening, but you get novelty. And it's emergent novelty because it's highly unexpected solutions to problems. That's what nature shows us. Well, that's kind of what innovation should be. Innovation is a search for unexpected solutions to problems in a competitive situation that isn't simply the linear combination of all the things that you could have varied, but in fact creates advantage. Um, another thing you take away if you believe in this notion, and by the way, those of you who have an engineering background may be thinking, you know, this is, this is highly kind of unpredictable, but you know, it's not goal-based, it's not design-based, so where does design fit into this? And, and I can tell you, at least in the fields that I work in, design is a short-term improv improvement over what comes in the long term, which is highly evolutionary and not design-based. It's hard to design a cure for cancer. I would say it's easier to design a better cure for cancer. I say cure for cancer as a, as a, as a euphemism for a better therapeutic uh, drug. It's better, you can design a better one, but designing one from scratch I think is something that has been overplayed in our fields. The other thing I want to just kind of observe is that failure is a necessary rampant component of an emergent process. In fact, if you take all the failures away, you cannot have advances. And yet people, society absolutely frowns upon failure, frowns upon experiments that don't work out, etc. There's nothing efficient about evolution, I would argue. There is something successful about evolution, but there isn't anything efficient. There's a lot, a lot of wasteful kind of things. And then the last thing I'll take away, again, I'm sorry some of this crosses over into personal philosophy, but is this notion that as, as people in the audience, I think all of you probably, if you wouldn't be here otherwise, have made peace with the fact that if you're going to be innovating, you're going to be disappointed most of the time. And making peace with disappointment is actually something that you really want to do as early in your life as you can. That's, at least in the U.S., education makes people avoid disappointment. You know, a bad grade is not something you look forward to. A bad grade reflects actually getting a bunch of things wrong. And so if you avoid getting a bunch of things wrong, and in this space, therefore, you will also avoid getting a bunch of things right, then a disappointment becomes a major inhibitor. And the feeling of, I, got, I don't want to be disappointed, therefore, I'm not going to even try. That is something, so I, I usually go around reminding people when they overly describe their disappointed feelings that this is just an overrated feeling. You're going to be disappointed 50 times a day, get over it. So that's just another thought to take away. The second uh, kind of clump of things that I just wanted to quickly go through is this notion of an immigrant mindset. 
So, you know, we're of course in a country of, of survivors. We're in a country of immigrants. In many ways, Armenians have been migrants, you know, forever. Some of that migration has been forcefully accelerated at various times, but we've been migrants for a long time. And one of the things that, that I've observed over these years is just how the mindset of an immigrant is essential to innovation. So just think about it for a second. What does an immigrant do when they go into a new country? They, first of all, get rid of all their pretense and all their expectations that something is owed to them. There's no immigrant receive, receiving country that owes the immigrant anything. And so, but that's okay, because they accept that for granted. They have no entitlement. They usually don't know the language, they don't know the culture, they doubt everything, they're worried about people kind of taking advantage of them. And that mindset of poised, making sure that you're surviving is a huge parallel to innovation. I would argue emphatically that innovation is just intellectual immigration. And that if you have experience in immigrating or just migrating, I don't mean physically leaving someplace, but being, being migrating into different fields, into different activities, that is a huge, huge advantage. So all of these things are things that play a role that I've taken away from, from these years. Um, the third general theme, and you'll see this play out in, in the remainder of what I'll say, is that much of breakthrough innovation starts being, by being unreasonable. So just think about it. What's the most unreasonable thing you thought of in the last day? Just blatantly unreasonable. When's the last time you told somebody else a completely unreasonable thing, knowingly? You don't, right? Because if you say unreasonable things, people frown upon you, people think you're stupid, you're unexperienced, you're naive, you're not an expert, and we spend most of our time seeming reasonable. In fact, I would argue that reasonableness, just again, sorry I'm dumping all this to you on a Monday of the last day, I mean on the first talk of the last day of this conference, but just I want you to think about it. Reasonableness, I would argue, is a form of intellectual gravity. The reason I can't jump very high not only because of my weight, this is gravity, right? Reasonableness is exactly that. Reasonableness does not allow us to escape what is currently possible. And yet, we know, looking backwards, that this device and every other thing that we rely on today is, an, is started life as a completely unreasonable thing. I don't know if you've seen the initial prototype of, of an iPhone, but it was the size of an iPad. There's a, there's a YouTube video in 1987, made in 1987 by Apple, that basically describes a communication device that people can talk into, etc. And it, I actually just very recently looked it up. It looks nothing like a phone. And that's where they developed the initial technology that led to the iPhone. So in you, when you look at it, you say, that's never going to be a phone. That's unreasonable. And yet, so I would argue, this, just as a, as, as a thought, at least coming, coming from some alien place, that if something doesn't start being unreasonable, it's probably not worth doing. Now, I'm sure this is not 100% true. There's probably a bunch of things that are worth doing that start reasonable. But on average, I'd, I'd rather you not discount things because they seem unreasonable. And furthermore, making something unreasonable seem reasonable is a really bad idea. Because what it does is that people who think they're investing in you think they're investing in something that's otherwise reasonable. And since you already know it's not, eventually they're going to find out just what kind of a risk they took. As an entrepreneur, never do that. Instead, try to convince people that it's okay to start with something unreasonable if you can describe a set of steps that might earn the, your way to making it reasonable. And that's kind of what the development process of innovation is that I'll describe to you. All right. Um, the last thing that, again, take away that I can, I can share with you is this notion of destination versus direction. In fact, a lot of these thoughts came out of the work that we did in Armenia, long, not, not in Boston, not in innovation, with Ruben, Pierre, Ardash Jesus here, Kazakhetsi, and others, back about 18, 17, 18 years ago, and many others, we worked on, uh, Andre, I think, is here too, Andrew Magritte, we worked on thinking about what could Armenia become. And we had a dilemma. All the experts kept telling us to focus on the current problems and offer solutions. Otherwise, we would be irrelevant. And we thought, well, if you keep working on the current problems, you'll never make systemic change. You'll just make a slightly better tomorrow. And that's true that over time, slightly better tomorrows might become really, really better day after tomorrows. More likely, it's going to be pretty damn close to today. 
So instead, we thought, well, why don't we first think about what could Armenia become? And that notion has influenced how we think about what I'm about to describe to you very, very genuinely. And that is, when you're an entrepreneur, when you're a value creator, should you pick a destination where it is that you feel value exists, whether it's three years from now, five years from now, ten years from now, or should you pick a direction? Now, either way, a direction could lead to a destination, except as you all know, we keep changing directions in this field, so which destination it takes you through is unknowable. Alternatively, a destination, especially if you select it from among several and you have conviction that there's value there and you look for proof, suggests directions that are somewhat more bound. And so even though you might take turns, you still have a sense of where you're headed. And that's another very, very important concept that has been uh, as, as we've played this out. All right. Let me, uh, okay, then let me just kind of use this as a jumping point for what I'm actually going to talk to you about, which is some thoughts about how, how one might innovate a little differently uh, in these spaces. The, the notion of unreasonableness took us to start thinking about where is opportunity really when it comes to totally new things. And, and, and I'd say that there's no shortage of opportunity. There's no shortage of exciting things to be working on. But a lot of them are way, way beyond where people have comfort, this idea of uh, reasonableness. So let me describe what I mean. I would contend that innovation mostly, that is carried out by the incumbents of today, the people who are leaders in their fields, this is the gray zone, basically covers the current space, this is called niche innovation, people who already have this, so iPhone 10 is a niche innovation from an iPhone 9 in the sense that they already own the space, and they're not, this is not a completely different out of the blue thing, it's improvements, it's filling in gaps, etc. And, and then adjacent, adjacency based innovations, things that are proximal. And you might say, well, what defines adjacency? I would argue what defines adjacency is the distance upon which people who do resource allocation, people who decide on budgets or on investment, on grants, they decide how far out does risk reward analysis work, right? So if I told you, that I'm going to jump from here to the other side of the stage, you might have a probability adjust and say, well, I, I don't think he can jump there. That's a pretty risky premise. But if I say I'm going to jump from here to the Marriott, you could not give me a risk assessment because it's not fathomable. You cannot compute on that. And I'd say, let me, let's think of that as the zone of adjacency. Now, insurgents, which are entrepreneurial innovators, generally occupy this space. And you might say, well, geez, why aren't they out here? And I'll explain in a minute. But this space of adjacency is actually where the action is. And the reason is because for an insurgent to raise money, they have to convince the current experts, whether that's in venture capital or grants, etc., big companies, that what they're proposing is reasonable, is computable, you can assess risk to it. Second, they also are in this space because they want these big guys to buy them out. So there's a clear zone of adjacency. And what we, what we got interested in when we went down this path is could you actually operate out here? Could you repeatedly assert value, discover value, whoops, out here? And then if you could, what would you do with it? Now, how do you get there from here? Think of this as kind of, you know, a deep space. I mean, how are you, just because you think there's value here doesn't mean that you can actually get there from here. So I would say this, what we call pioneering, this is why my firm is, is now called Vent, uh, Flagship Pioneering, would be the act of <coughs> trying to end up in a new place for the first time. And there's many people in the room who are themselves pioneering in the areas they're in. And that's a very different kind of innovation than what you find in this space. So what I'm going to tell you is one approach to thinking systematically about innovation in the pioneering sense of the word, doing things that have never been done. And I want to sound a bit controversial, so I'm going to make some assertions that will be a little bit offensive probably, but just to get you to think a little. So I would argue that today, science-driven innovation, biotechnology, nanotechnology, data science, many, many fields, science-driven innovation operates according to this type of mindset, which is that there are scientific advances, and we all know the scientific method, and it's served society well in creating massive knowledge from where we were a mere 50 or 100 years ago. Some of these scientific advances constitutes discoveries, 
discoveries of a whole new thing that we had no concept about forces us to re reformulate our theories about things or, or, or realize that things that we didn't even know existed now affect our, our, our view of the order of things. Sometimes these things lead to new technologies, technologies that enable even further scientific advances. And then they may have applications in health and in agriculture, other places of society, and that application, once it's identified, leads to what's called translational research, that is now taking the science and the technology and applying it to enable some, some important new capability, and that might lead to new products and startups and, that, and the startup methodology to take it forward. So I would say that this approach, which works well, describes, the, my view, the totality of what happens, is in some can be described this way, which is that with roots firmly planted in the past, that is, historic knowledge, you're working today, oh boy, I'm gonna need more than three minutes. We don't have to have questions, I'm just gonna, I have more slides than this, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going. I will have 15 minutes for questions, you can ask me questions later, sorry. Um, so, I'd say with roots firmly planted in the past, you're working today on the future. So the future is the result of what you're doing. Now, I guess my point to you is, there's another way of thinking about all this, uh, I would, otherwise I wouldn't be talking to you, uh, and that is what I would call reverse discovery. That is, that is starting with something that you would like to exist, but for the fact that there's no connection to the current reality. You might be thinking science fiction, right? Just embrace that thought for a second. Um, and and if, if innovation is really emergent, then if you start with hypotheses about where value might be, and I'm using these words carefully, leap to the future and say, okay, of all the possible ways I could do this, it, independent of how I'm gonna get there, this is very, very important. You cannot, you cannot assess what's worth doing based on what you already know you can do. That's the definition of gravity. That'll keep you right back to what's being done today. So if you can suspend gravity for a second, gravity in this case is dogma. By the way, you might be thinking, boy, I spent all my life becoming an expert, and if that is getting in the way of innovation, what am I doing? And, and I'd say it's worth thinking about. Experts hardly ever, in my experience, make major breakthroughs. They be, are called experts after they make major breakthroughs. They're not experts before they make major breakthroughs, because once they become experts, they fill their time thinking about all the things that can't be done and all the things that can be done that are proximal that will double down on their expertise. I, I really mean this very honestly. Uh, uh, this is what we run into. So the idea I would put forward for you is, can you foresee something that might be valuable? Foretell is an important thing. If you can't communicate it to other people, you're not gonna get any communal thinking about, is this actually valuable? Can you actually think about ways to get there? And then can you set out to reach that place sooner than other people can? This is kind of the general idea. So I would say that ideas about future solutions, since they always start as unreasonable, are usually discarded. But if, since we know that a lot of technology evolves across generations and that you've got to create this descendancy thing, I would say this is an alternative way of pursuing the space out here. So, among the things you could argue about doing, pick some that you could articulate what the value might be and see if you can come backwards. So this is kind of time travel and discovery. The reason I call this reverse discovery is because it's like reverse engineering, except since we're working on things that aren't engineered, right? Reverse engineering works because a human engineered it. I can take this apart, well, I might not, but you might, and figure out how it works because a human engineered it. Reverse engineering of an evolved system is, is an altogether different thing, and it's, I, 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 would, I would quarrel with whether that can be done. You can reverse evolve something, but I don't know how you reverse engineer it. You can potentially do reverse discovery, and that's what I'm trying to lay the groundwork for. So, in this case, I would say this approach you could think about as roots firmly planted in the future, but operating in the present. And that's a very uncomfortable feeling, by the way, because people will make fun of you, people will constantly say, how do you know it's gonna work? And you have no answer to that, because you don't know it's gonna work except you can point to lots of other things that nobody knew could work that came from the same place. So if you ask them back, how, do you, how did they know that it was gonna work? The answer is they didn't either. And so this is kind of the, 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 the dilemma. And in fact, a pretty inspiring image 
of what this is all about is the first photos that were taken of Earth from Apollo 8. What we as humanity thought about the planet